My name is David Bowes. I am the Communications Director for Washington Policy Center. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, latest virtual event, uh, Washington Policy on the Go event, with our initiative on Agriculture Director Pam Lewison, who you can see on your screen uh, right now. And we'll be joined a bit later by Todd Myers, uh, our Center for the Environment Director. And uh, after we speak with each of our center directors here will have a Q&A session where we'll take your questions. It's really easy. Just go into the chat box there. You can ask the question at any time. Um, as we're talking, if something pops in your head, it's good to get it on, uh, get it down, write it up, um, put it into the question function there on the right-hand side of your screen in your toolbox, and then we'll sort through those at the end and, and make sure that we get uh, um, all questions possible. Uh, answered. So, you know, again, don't hesitate to put it in there at any point uh, during this uh, presentation. And um, and so we'll answer it if, uh, the best we can. Um, also, people are free to come and go. Uh, we expect the broadcast to last between 45 minutes and an hour. So we'll respect your time and your lunch break. And uh, we'll be complete. This, uh, this presentation will be completed by one o'clock. So thanks again for joining us. I uh, hope you're um, hope you're watching for our events regularly. Uh, we're trying to increase our uh, virtual events and vary them, and we'll have virtual events going uh, up to the end of the year. So it should be fine. But I thought we'd start this time since we've got kind of an environmental and uh, and um, agricultural themed um, presentation today, and we've got a holiday week uh, with Thanksgiving coming up. I wanted to bring uh, Pam on to talk about uh, her work detailing how a Thanksgiving dinner can be a lesson in farming, particularly since there's this great, you know, urban-rural divide in terms of perception of uh, farming and farm life. So, Pam, why don't you start with just telling us, you know, what gave you the idea to kind of tackle this issue of, of uh, breaking down the cost of a Thanksgiving dinner and applying it to farming? So, I think there's a perception that, um, farmers make a lot of money off of their products. And so what I kind of wanted to highlight was that there's a lot of money that's lost between uh, the farm gate and a consumer's plate. And that's um, where the, the impetus of this became or com came from. And what, by money lost, what do you mean by that? When, when you say- So you know, on average, uh, a farmer only makes about 14 cents out of every dollar spent on regular groceries. And the rest of that dollar is um, split up between processors, transportation, grocery stores. There's a lot of other um, costs that get split up among other parts of the supply chain. So how would this work on a Thanksgiving dinner? I mean, just roughly speaking, you know, let's say we're sitting down, we've got the turkey, uh, unless you're a real traditionalist and you're going with salmon uh, or, or wild turkey and some, mm. not the drink, the, the bird. But, um, you know, if people sit down, break it down for us uh, in, in general, just a few of the key items in, in terms of how, you know, how much is going back to the farmer and how people can think about that. So I think there's a couple of key um, costs that people think about, you know, uh, on average, you pay about a dollar twenty-nine a pound for a turkey. Um, out of that that per pound price, a farmer is only um, garnering about six cents out of that pound per pound price. Um, another great one to look at is mashed potatoes because if you live in Washington and you don't have mashed potatoes on Thanksgiving. Um, I need to talk with some folks at the Potato Commission. Um, on average, you're paying about a dollar a pound for potatoes for a five pound bag. Um, farmers are getting 60 cents of that. So that's one where there's a little bit more um, benefit to it. However, if you look at what it costs to raise um, those same spuds, you're talking about a cost of approximately $950 an acre to raise those potatoes. So there's, um, there's a, a vast disparity there. Um, and then the other one I wanted to highlight was milk. Um, milk production is something where there's a, there is a point at which you start to make money versus losing money. Um, most of our dairies in Washington are fairly small and they typically are on the losing end of that income disparity. Um, a regular gallon of milk costs about three fifty, and a farmer's only getting about $1.50 out of that. So when you sit down to that icy cold milk, um, there's a there's a much broader um, cost disparity there. So 
you know, why is it, when when people think of markets and you know and supply and demand, um, you think, okay, well, you know, why would farmers stay in business if if they're not going to make money off the milk? What's is it just love of love of the farm or what's what's happening with the smaller farms? I think that's a lot of it. Um, I, I think the the tricky thing about agriculture and farming in general is that farming is both a business and a lifestyle at the same time. So there are some um, there's a lot of personal um, investment that's rolled into farming because you you live where you work. So you see it every single day when you wake up, when you walk out the door. Um, your personal investment is as equal to your business investment. And you can't um, you can't separate those two in a really easy way when you farm. At the end of the day, did you figure out if, if we're sitting down at uh, Thanksgiving dinner, how much of that is going to the farmer? So if I I based it on about $100 spent for a, a full Thanksgiving meal, um, and farmers are getting about $11 out of that. So when you're sitting down with your family and maybe one or two of your uh, perhaps left-leaning relatives are claiming that far farmers are making too much money and they're not paying any taxes. You can whip out Pam's study on how much taxes farmers actually pay, and you can point out that they're only making about eleven dollars off off the meal. And that's all the different farmers. You know, it's not like it's one farmer who's who's growing the turkeys, the potatoes, the asparagus, and you know, and the various fruits and vegetables that go into the other uh, items. This is, a, this is divided on, onto many, many, many farmers. So. Um, Pam, but you, you brought up dairy farmers, and uh, that leads me to something a little less festive in spirit that I did want to ask you about very briefly before we move okay. to Todd. And that's, you had a post recently about a Washington State Supreme Court case that could dramatically impact specifically dairy farmers, but perhaps other farmers as well. And mm -hmm. you, know, you pointed out that some of them are on the brink already, financially speaking, uh, but that this this court, court case could really hammer those who are following the law, by the way, who are following what the law was for the last you know several years um but they could find themselves with with big trouble ahead why don't you describe what happened for us there so on november 5th the supreme court ruled that the overtime exemption which keeps dairy producers from having to pay overtime to their employees was um struck down uh as being an unconstitutional uh part of our state's constitution and um, what that means is that dairy farmers will now have to start paying time and a half for any hour worked over 40 hours. Um, the, the problem with that ruling is sort of twofold. There was a door that was opened that would um, potentially allow workers to sue for three years of back pay um, from their employers uh, and the rough estimate from the Washington State Dairy Federation is that would make uh, a total impact of about 120 million dollars for uh, dairy farmers in our state um, and dairy is unique in that um, it was really heavily affected by COVID um, they've been on a downward slide for the last five or so years in terms of money potentially being made uh, and in Washington state, we have lost dairy farms at a rate of about four a week over the last decade or so, according to um, according to the last farm census. So we we're, we're already have this pretty fast rate of, att of attrition with farms. And then you add in this potential for a, a vast amount of money that has to be paid out very quickly. Um, and there's a a great potential that it will just close dairy farms in our state. Yeah, and wouldn't this spread? I mean, is this wouldn't the same logic to this case uh, apply to other businesses? I mean, maybe even outside of farming, but but I guess this is ag specific because there was an ag exemption here. So you know, but outside of dairy farming, anyway. I mean, this this seems to me to endanger basically anybody in agribusiness in the state. Which you know, just for perspective, I know we think of ourselves as you know Boeing and the military and uh, high tech uh, firms like Microsoft and and Google and Amazon, but but dairy's right up there, you know, with right. with an economic engine of the state. So um, it's a big deal. Agriculture in total is the third largest economic impactor in our state. So it's a huge deal. And this ruling does open the door for the rest of ag to be in the same boat as dairy producers are. Um, if, if 
there's a will to start asking those questions. And um, I suspect that there will be. The, the really um, impactful part of it or the part that's frightening for um, ag people and, and farmers in particular is that they're going to be asked to have to look at their employees and say, I am grateful for the work you do, uh, but now I have to pay you less. And, you know, as we're coming up on Thanksgiving and, and um, the December holidays after that, uh, it's difficult to have to look someone in the eye and say, I can't pay you what I used to pay you. And we're going to have to work out something where you can still work and I can still function my business. Yeah, I, I just I, I I think of this, and I'm I'm wondering if anyone on the court has worked on a farm, uh, because it's just it is, as you say, it's it's kind of like a cowboy lifestyle too. There's there's farming and cowboy and ranchers. They they have a certain life uh, that they lead that is required in the in the taking care of animals. I I didn't grow up on a farm, but I grew up next to farms, and I'm related, shirt tail to many farmers. And it's a it's a different breed, you know. And so, you know, as a farmer yourself, you're very very well connected to this. I just look at this, and I think if you apply it to any other form of of industry, and suddenly you're slammed with, I was following the rules, but might have to uh, pay back pay for three years. I, I mean, for crying out loud, it's it's bad enough without COVID uh, involved. That's that's just devastating uh, to me and and unfair fundamentally. So, but we'll talk more about that, Pam. We're going to open open it up to questions for you, you know, toward the end. So, appreciate uh, you coming on. I'm going to bring Todd Myers, our Center for the Environment Director, on as we uh, say goodbye to Pam uh, for a while until we get to the Q and A portion. Todd's been working with uh, some of our state's native peoples, uh, tribes. Uh, to uh, work with them on on exploring their methods for land and wildlife management. Uh, he's created a couple of different videos that you can see on our YouTube channel that have been extremely well received, where we featured uh, tribal members there to talk about those those videos. And um, we'll try and get uh, the I'll, I'll try and put the link to the videos in the chat section so that you can see them for yourselves afterward. But Tata, why don't you just uh, open it up for us and and uh, tell us about your exploration of uh, tribal management in terms of uh, wildlife and and uh, and land management and and tell us about this project of yours. Yeah, so we did uh, three videos um, with uh, uh, two tribes in Washington State. One of them I'll be talking about uh, that we did with the Nisqually tribe about their uh, hatcheries, uh, but we did two others with the Confederated tribes of the Colville Reservation. One about wildlife management, specifically focusing on wolves, how they're dealing with wolves. Um, they are right in the center of where a lot of the um, wolf population now is. They thought that there would only be two packs. They now have five. So it's interesting on how they deal with that. Um, and you can watch that video. And then another video about forest management um, and trying to get our forests back to a healthy state. We had a lot of forest fires this summer. Um, and people, you know, focused primarily on climate change. But the fact is, is that uh, forest health or poor forest health was really a driver across the West in those fires. It is a widely recognized problem and the tribe is uh, on the, or the tribes on the confederated uh, tribes of the Calder Reservation are doing something about it. And it's a really great story. The one I want to focus on, though, for this discussion is uh, the Nisqually hatchery for the Nisqually tribe in South Puget Sound. So I sit on the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council. Uh, our job is to try to figure out where to target our efforts so that we uh, restore habitat and increase the salmon populations. Um, this year, we had a poor return uh, across Puget Sound. Um, one of the areas that I uh, looked at was the Elwha um, River. There's been a lot of talk about taking down the Elwha dams and how that was gonna increase fish populations. This year, we saw a very low return, second lowest in the last six years. Um, <clears throat> while on the Snake River, ironically, uh, we actually had a, a big year of recovery. Last couple years were low, and then it was a, there was a recovery going on. So what you see in these cycles, um, so there's a lot that goes on in the ocean, but what we've got to figure out is how can we do things um, in the near shore in terms of habitat and in hatcheries to make sure that enough fish are going out um, so that whatever the situation is with the ocean conditions, enough come back. 
And it's really difficult to know what you need to do because sometimes it takes a long time um, to improve habitat and see an ecosystem response, see that you know salmon populations are truly recovering because of what you've done. And because it takes so long, you don't necessarily know that what you've done is the right thing or that you've put money in the right place, and that makes it very difficult. So hatcheries are an important part of making sure that while you're doing the science, while you're taking those steps to do the right thing, that you have a backup plan, that you don't, that you have a safety net essentially. The Elwha is a good example. We tore down those two dams, very expensive, big, you know, um, effort, and we're not seeing the returns yet that we want. But the reason that we are still seeing salmon there is because of the hatchery. And in fact, something like 96% of the fish in the Elwha right now are hatchery fish. If that hatchery wasn't there, um, you know, we might not have a population at all, despite the fact that they tore down the dams. The great thing about tribal hatcheries also is, is that they have a few things that work, that, that drive them to be successful. First, they have the local knowledge, right? They, they work on those streams. They are, they, they've been there for a long time. Um, and so they have people who year after year um, see the changes, see what's happening, and can combine that with, with modern science to say, okay, let's figure out how to improve the returns that we're getting. Second, they have the incentives. A lot of the fights about tribal fisheries have been because tribal members rely on fish either for sustenance or economics or both. Um, so they have a strong incentive to get it right. Um, if they fail, they can't just go, oh, well, we'll try something else. It really costs them. So they're going to work very hard to make sure that what they're doing is positive and has a benefit. So the so the tribal hatcheries have three things. One, they have the local knowledge. Second, they have the incentives. And third, they have local freedom. Now, they still have to follow a lot of the laws that um, others have to follow, but they have local, more local governance and more control to push the limits and do interesting things. And actually, if you watch the video from the Nisqually tribe, they will talk about how um, the Endangered Species Act and the bureaucracy that goes along with the Endangered Species Act limits their ability to do some cool things and, and, and use cutting edge science to improve the results of their hatchery production. Tribes can do that in a way that others can't. And so I, the reason I like focusing on tribal stewardship of natural resources is that it really fits with Eleanor Ostrom uh, and her idea about how local communities manage natural resources. So Eleanor Ostrom um, was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics, and she looked around the world um, at local solutions to uh, natural resources problems. And what she found is that getting local people together with the knowledge and incentives often did far better than top-down approaches um, that were coercive. Tribes, I think, are a good example of that. And, and I think if you uh, watch the video, um, you can see, um, you can hear them talk about um, what they're doing and why. <clears throat> For a long time, hatchery production in Puget Sound had been declining. Now it's going up again because we recognize that without that production, we're not going to have fish, not just for sport and commercial, not just for tribes, but for orca um, and other, you know, um, and for just having them, just helping them recover. So hatcheries are, I think, are recognized as an important part of the solution um, and give us some leeway while we try to figure out what best to do in habitat and other things like that. So uh, with that, um, I want to bring um, Pam back and we can open it up to some questions uh, from the audience. Um, and if you have questions, um, I think the best way to do it is to go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, and then we, uh, I, for either of us, um, I, I'm having a difficult time uh, seeing the questions. But anyway, um, I see we have one question. But before we get to that one, um, Pam, uh, I wanted to uh, ask you another question, which is the legislature is coming up next year. Um, and what are some issues that you think are that they're going to be tackling that people should pay attention 
so that we can make sure that agriculture continues to be strong in Washington State. Um, so one of your favorite topics, I think, is going to come up. We're going to talk about carbon taxes a lot, I think, in the next legislative session. Um, but I also... Favorite quotes, favorite. <laughs> favorite. Um, but I also, I think that um, ag labor in general is going to be a really hot topic um, through the legislative session. I think we have um, an opportunity, I hope, to change how we start, you know, how we talk about... Um, the relationship between ag employers and, and ag employees. It's, a, it's very much a symbiotic relationship. And I think that we need to start um, treating it as such. But um, certainly legislation thus far, or proposed legislation thus far, um, has really tried to sort of separate those two things as being um, individual entities. And, I, and then I think the, you know, the other big topic um, I'm hoping is that we can have a discussion about mental health and the, the stressors that go into ag because they're a little bit different than um, general, uh, the sort of general public. And then, um, you know, I think everything else is going to be a toss up. We'll just have to see what happens. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is for me, it says, how does the high and low return on the snake and Elwha include both hatchery and wild populations? And the answer is yes, both of those rivers have hatchery and wild populations. Like I said, on the Elwha, the returns um, have been about 96% hatchery. Um, I was told by somebody at the hatchery, but they have not released a report on this, that last year hatchery returns were 98%. Um, and they said this year that they obviously haven't uh, looked at all of the carcasses, but that this year they thought it was uh, in that very high range again. So what you're getting on the Elwha is still very much hatchery. The, um, on the snake, you're also seeing a lot of uh, hatchery returns. I can't remember the percentages off the top of my head, but they're, it's significant. Um, but you're, you're also seeing a wild population that continues to exist. Um, and Importantly, with the snake, the um, survival rate downstream um, is increasingly high. So you're seeing more of both um, populations of fish, of fish return. Uh, there was a study recently that pointed out that what are called smolt to adult return ratios, which is how many fish go out and then how many return. This has been one of the issues on the Snake River that's been highlighted, that the percentage is very low. Um, but what they did is they looked at the whole region and found that the return ratio, small to adult return ratios, were low and very similar all across the region, even in some pristine areas. That's not the only thing that matters. Populations also matter a lot. Obviously, that's the goal is to get the populations up. And if you have one fish go out and one fish return and you have a 100% return rate, that's still bad because you only had one fish. If you have a million fish go out, you only have a 1% return, that's probably not as, even though it's 1%, it's probably not as a big concern because you have so many fish going out. So th those ratios are not um, everything, um, but they're part of the story. And especially since we're trying to increase populations, the more fish you can have return, um, the better. The other question we have um, is about um, farmers in the legislature. Um, so it says, how many are how many farmers are in the legislature? Um, Ron Muzzle, um, I think I can never pronounce his last name correctly, um, from the 10th, from Island County in Western Washington, is a farmer. There are others, but um, so talk a little bit about that if you know others, but also talk about um, whether the farmers are the ones who are making farm policy in Washington state. Uh, so there are a few others I can think of off the top of my head. Um, Senator Mark Schessler, uh, Senator Judy Warnick, um, Representative Tom Dent, and um, Minority Leader uh, J.T. Wilcox, uh, also Representative Joel Kretz, uh, Jacqueline Maycumber, Shelley Short. Um, those, are, those are the ones that come to mind right away. I was trying to do a quick stock in my head while, while you were answering your question. Um, but the thing is that um, by and large, the people who are connected to agriculture are not the ones who are making most of these policy suggestions. So um, when it's a 
suggestion for something like the fee increase to the H2A program, for example. That's um, not a suggestion that came from um, someone directly related to production agriculture. So, um, and there, there are a, a small minority of the number of people that we have in the legislature. So I think there's some concern that um, we have these policies floated by people who aren't directly connected to um, where their food comes from. And the challenge obviously is, is that if farmers outside their district go under or struggle, right, they're not, they're not their constituents and they're not hearing from them directly. So it's hard to get that direct accountability um, for people, for legislators who make bad decisions. Uh, I think there's also some, you know, we, a lot of those uh, legislators that I named happen to live in Eastern Washington. And so I think there's, um, you know, there's also not so much a, that it's a regional divide, but that there is a, um, an accountability difference when you're looking at um, legislators who, like you talked about, have to answer to a, a particular set of constituents. All right, we're getting other good questions come in. Uh, there's another question that says, does sewage overflow contribute significantly to salmon population declines? So what we have seen, um, especially in King County, is we have seen big sewage overflow. So you'll get a, you'll get a big rain event. Um, it'll cause a sewage overflow. Raw sewage will go out into Puget Sound. Um, it's not the only place, but it's we've seen some very big ones, um, and we've seen it more than once. That's the problem is that um, you'd think that they would fix it, but they unfortunately haven't. So um, there was one, I think, a couple of years ago was the last really big one I'm trying to remember. And I remember um, looking to see if salmon returns and other things were impacted by those um, sewage uh, uh, overflows. And the Department of Fish and Wildlife said that they didn't detect any. Or uh, Now, it's very difficult with everything um, that goes on in Puget Sound um, to, to sort of isolate, even when you have single big events like that, um, what the cause is um, and, and whether it is the cause of increased or decreased um, uh, you know, uh, salmon runs. It's certainly not good. We know that. Um, so, um, how much of an impact, if it was repeated, I think it would have a much, you would obviously start to see the impact. Um, when you have one, it doesn't, when you see one occasionally, it doesn't mean that it's not impacting, it's just hard to discern, that's all. Um, so, I think it's, it's, it's a problem, but how big a problem I think is difficult. The same thing happened with the um, net pen. There was a net pen that had um, some farmed fish in it. It collapsed, the farm fish got out, um, people uh, in the environmental community declared it a disaster, said it was gonna wipe out salmon um, runs, that it would, they were gonna outcompete them, they were gonna potentially um, eat smolt and things like that, and none of that appears to have happened. Um, and again, I asked the Department of Fish and Wildlife if they found evidence of the, the farm fish getting out, farming um, wild and hatchery salmon, and they said they didn't really see it, that they just, that uh, there was very little impact. Um, so it's a good question, but it's it's part of the difficulty of determining what's causing um, declines. Uh, another question says, do hatchery fish breed with the wild and native fish? Um, so at, um, uh, one of the things that the hatcheries try to do is to increase genetic diversity. And part of that is um, including wild um, stock with um, wild genetics with hatchery genetics to improve them. They do try to segregate in some ways, and what you will see are the timing. So what the Nisqually tribe does, for example, is that they time the releases of the fish. So the wild fish will, will come in, um, will lay eggs and then the wild fish will go out in the spring and then the hatchery won't release their smolt until the wild fish have left to make sure that the hatchery fish are not out competing the wild fish because you know at any given time there's only a certain amount of forage in a river and you don't want a huge flood of fish going out 
and overwhelming the capacity of that river to feed all those fish. So they do do some things to take advantage of and promote genetic diversity um, using wild stocks, but they also are careful to make sure that they're not doing other things like that would homogenize that genetic um, diversity by lumping all the hatchery and wild fish together as they go out. So um, they, they're really clever about it and um, they've done a lot of research. And so um, it is a little bit, there is an element of science and art to it, um, but that's kind of how they try to do it. Um, let's see, next question. Have you seen wild straying salmon begin to populate newly restored rivers like the Elwha or hatchery from other locations? So the Elwha is very much like um, a culvert. So right now, Washington State um, has is under a court order to remove fish blockages, which are small culverts that basically block a lot of habitat upstream that fish can't get to. We know that opening up that habitat can be helpful. That's basically what the Elwha was, was just a giant fish blockage because there was no fish ladder. So you remove the two dams. We have not seen Chinook numbers increase. We have seen them go upstream. What we have really seen are steelhead because there was a rainbow trout population that some of which converted to steelhead. So steelhead are just anadromous rainbow trout which go out and spawn whereas the rainbow, rainbow trout stay in freshwater. We have seen a good reaction from steelhead. We have not seen that same reaction from Chinook, but we have seen them going farther upstream and taking advantage of some of that habitat. The response, because the populations haven't increased, hasn't been what we want in terms of population, but they are using it. So that's so we are seeing some of that. Um, all right, while we wait for other questions, uh, Pam, you did a fantastic study this year on the taxes that farmers pay. So in Washington state, we don't put sales tax on food for the most part. Um, and so for that, that's one of the reasons that we keep taxes low on farmers because, it, you know, it's, it's sort of silly to say we're not going to charge you sales tax on food, but we will charge the farmer who then just passes on the, the taxes to people. It's just, a, it's the same sort of thing, right? We're trying to make food affordable. So, but what the, the problem with that is, is that then legislators have a perception that farmers don't pay any taxes at all. Um, and so there has been some talk in recent years that farmers aren't paying their fair share. You did an excellent study looking at how much they actually do pay. Why don't you tell us what you found? So um, thank you, first of all. Uh, and farmers pay um, on average, well, my my conservative estimate, we'll put it that way, it was that farmers pay an annual tax bill of about $1 billion with a B. So, um, and there's some there's some interesting things that, that go in that um, study and some sort of minutia that I think is interesting, particularly that, um, Washington and Hawaii are the only two states where farmers are required to pay sales tax on equipment purchases, um, which is a big ticket item. You know, if you're if you're in the market for a combine, you're probably paying close to three quarters of a million dollars for a new one. Um, and then you have your tax on top of that. So um, I, that, of course, is a, one of the small details that I would I personally would like to see change, make, you know, equipment purchases a little more um, cost effective or affordable. And I think the other um, the other one that's really important is that there's a perception that farmers don't pay things like property taxes. Um, and farmers who own their farms or even just their homes pay property taxes just like everybody else. So those both of those are, um, I think, key points in that study. And with property taxes in particular, that's why I say it's an estimated $1 billion because no farm is exactly the same. So you can't, um, you can't come up with a real number for what property taxes are being paid because every farm has, you know, 
buildings that may be assessed differently or they have um, you know more or less acres or the tax rate is different um, so there's there's a lot of variables that go into that um, that conservative billion dollar number but it's catchy so that helps and and it has the benefit of being true and accurate so you you know if you want to find that study on our web page you can see that Pam um, went through several areas of taxes and added them up and 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 that's the kind of the, the challenge in the legislature often um, is that for people who don't live it every day um, which a lot of people don't live farming every day they don't live in those communities um, it is hard to know what is true and what is false because you don't you don't have something to weigh it against right you only hear and so what we can do is provide is do sort of the digging down into the data um, where our eyes get beady and then we can say look here is actually what's going on so the arguments that you're hearing um, which you have no way of sort of testing because you, your neighbors aren't farmers here is what the actual data are and you can you can find that out um, so uh, one of the questions another question we got is uh, do dairy farmers and farmers in general um, have a lobbying force and I know the answer to that but I'll let you answer it um, and then I think the second part of that is for people who aren't farmers um, but people who are concerned about agriculture what can they do um, to support the lobbying efforts so there are lobby groups there are organi organizations that are both based specifically on uh, on a commodity so um, cattle feeders uh, is a representation of people who run um, who run feedlots in for instance or the Washington Potato Commission obviously their their uh, big deal is to market potatoes and represent them um, to legislative folks and others but there's also some really large overarching groups so um, dairy the dairy Federation Washington State Dairy Federation, um, is their primary lobbying group, and they're a great source for all sorts of information about um, our dairy producers in this state. And also, uh, Washington State Farm Bureau is a voice for all, all people connected with agriculture. They are not commodity specific, and they lobby on behalf of any sort of ag uh, umbrella group. And I think that's um, having those is really important. Um, but also, to, to answer the other part of your question. I think it's critical um, for everyone to start to feel connected with where their food comes from. Um, Washington is a bountiful state. We produce more than 300 um, food and fiber products on farms in, in our humble little state here. And it's important for us to connect with um, connect growers with their consumers or producers with their consumers. And if consumers are at all interested in supporting um, their food producers, there are lots of ways to do it. Um, you can go direct to your source and talk with um, legislators and say, you know, I, I'm concerned about food security and um, food affordability, and I wanna make sure that our farms are giving, given the best advantage possible. Um, you can also, you know, make inroads with any number of those um, lobby, lobby and industry groups to um, to have a better connection with what's going on in ag. Uh, whether it's an associate membership uh, where you're you're not a voting member because you're not farming, but your dollars are still being used to represent um, the people who produce your food. Yeah, and and it's always important to remember that. <clears throat> People should just contact their legislators, um, even if they're not farmers, and say that they're concerned about these issues because it benefits all of us, it benefits our economy. Um, and let me just say, in terms of lobbying, um, one of the worst things about the COVID legislative session next year is that it will probably mean that they will have to skip beef lobbying day um if uh, the uh, beef day on the legislative campus is probably the best because um uh, they they show off a lot of their product and share it with anyone who's on campus um so it's always a good day to go and uh, 
um, go hungry. Um, Last year, Beef and Potato Day coincided, as I recall. And so you, you were able to get um, some really delicious grilled beef and a baked potato at the same time. So there, there is some benefit to, uh, as aggravating as it can be, you know, working on the hill, there is some benefit sometimes. So we've got a bunch of good questions. Keep them coming. Uh, I'm trying to scroll through them. Um, if you have other questions on topics we haven't raised, feel free. Um, and we will try to answer them or at least uh, make something up. Uh, there is another question that says there's there is a proposal for a saltwater based hatcheries in place like Bellingham um, that are privately owned using an Alaska model. Uh, and what do I think about that? I think it's really interesting. Um, I think, uh, like I said, the one of the benefits of the tribal hatcheries is, is that they have local knowledge and they have incentives. And the private model gets, they get paid based on the results, um, which I think is very uh, positive. Um, it seems to have worked in um, Alaska. Um, there would, I think there would have to be changes to the laws in Washington state. And I know this has been discussed and proposed, but I know there was a group in Bellingham who was interested in doing this um, in part because they can make some money, but in part because um, they want to improve, um, <coughs> excuse me, the um, population of salmon. I think one of the people who's involved actually um, has a refrigerator um, where they keep uh, salmon. And so they see the need for it um, and so they're interested in the topic and they want to do it. I think we have to try a variety of things. Um, and the more that you can give people incentives for success um, and reward them that way, um, the more we're going to try new things. Not everything is going to work out. You have to make sure that you're not doing counterproductive things, but you also have to be sure that you're incentivizing new innovation. And that's one of the things that if you watch the, like I said, if you watch the video with the Nisqually tribe, um, they talk about doing innovative things and how the bureaucracy sometimes slows them down. If we just keep doing the same thing over and over again, we're either going to make very slow progress or no progress. The numbers are going in the wrong direction right now. Um, the state, 2020 is a target for a number of um, increases in populations of Chinook, habitat, and other things like that set as part of the Puget Sound Partnership. If you go to their dashboard, you'll find that on many of those key targets, we're nowhere close. So we can't keep doing the same thing. We need to be innovative. We need to make sure that we're getting the most bang for our buck. So um, programs like the ones that they're talking about, the private hatchery, based on the Alaska, Alaska model, I think are really interesting. Um, uh, there's a lot of work to be done on that, but I think it, uh, I think it could be really positive. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned uh, while I look at other questions was concern about carbon taxes. Um, that was the first thing you said. Um, so tell me sort of how carbon taxes hit farmers and farming and, and um, what, what you hear is coming in, in the next session. So uh, the interesting thing about carbon uh, taxes or fees or whatever you want to call them is that um, you know, on farms, we use a ubiquitous amount of fuel in particular, and there's other inputs that go along with that, whether it's fertilizers, pesticides, those sorts of things can fall under a carbon tax proposal. Um, and I think that what farmers would propose in answer to that is that we also offset a lot of our carbon use um, by growing plants and um, sequestering some carbon in the soil if you are in a low till or no till environment. So I think the, the larger question is whether or not these um, taxes will turn into real world fee increases uh, that ultimately make it more difficult to produce food in the long run because ultimately um, farmers don't get to set their market price. It's set by uh, commodities index on a daily basis. So it can go from up here to down here uh, in less than 24 hours. So um, it's it's not an environment where farmers can say, okay, well, I have to pay 22 cents more a gallon for fuel on my farm. I'm going to figure out somewhere else to pass that 22 cents on. Uh, it's 22 cents that has to be absorbed in their annual budget. Yeah. 
So just to, so for context, one of the proposals is a $25 per metric ton carbon tax. What that means in the real world is about a 22 cent per gallon gas tax increase. It obviously would apply also to natural gas and other products that are made with petroleum goods in, in Washington state. But uh, the simplest way to think about it is a 22 cent a gallon gas tax increase. Some farm fuels are exempt from taxes, but many are not, and transportation is not. Um, and so <clears throat> the more you distort those costs, the more you make it difficult for farmers here compared to Idaho and elsewhere, um, especially when you are talking about that kind of massive um, increase. Uh, so uh, should the should January 20th end up with uh, Joe Biden taking the oath of office? Um, one of the questions is, what changes do you expect in regards to the availability of farm workers? Um, I know that uh, the H-2A visas has been a challenge that Washington state um, is actually um, taking steps to make it harder um, to hire H-2A workers. So talk a little bit about the work that you've done on that and what you found about what the state is doing and what you think a Biden administration might do. So um, I'll talk about the administration first. There's There hasn't been any indicator that there will be a change in the number of H-2A visas available. Uh, and to be clear, H-2A visas are unlimited. So the only limit is whether or not you can uh, get your application in under the deadline. So we can have as many H-2A workers in uh, Washington as we can apply for in the correct manner. Uh, it's a lengthy process. You have to advertise 60 days in advance, and then you have to show your worker shortage based on that advertising rate. Uh, so I think it's safe to say that workers will be available uh, and in Washington in particular, that's really important. We are among the top five states uh, in terms of the number of H-2A workers that we request every year. This year was a little bit different with COVID that there was some concern about people being able to cross borders and getting visas. So our trend for 2020, like everything else, will have an asterisk next, next to it, pointing mm -hmm. to the pandemic as having an impact on the number of people who came to Washington on a visa to work. And in our state in particular, there's a push to make uh, to make the H-2A program more expensive to participate in. It's already a very expensive program. It costs approximately $1,500 per worker just to go through the application process. That doesn't include the cost of transportation to get your workers uh, from their homes to your farm. It does not include the cost of covering their salaries while they're here, nor does it cover the cost of housing uh, that you are required to provide to your H-2A workers. So there's a, a whole other set of costs associated with H-2A. And the addition of the, or the proposed addition to the application fee is really about administrative work. And I, I question whether or not it's really necessary, to be perfectly honest. Um, reading through the final report from Employment Security, um, or at least the, the last draft I saw, they've not yet justified where that money will go and why they're currently having a budget shortfall. So um, one other thing, um, uh, that you wrote about recently was, so you mentioned um, sequestering carbon in the ground using no-till, um, which is uh, regenerative agriculture. And there is a new documentary about regenerative agriculture called Kiss the Ground, um, published, uh, coming out of Hollywood, featuring a whole number of Hollywood celebrities. Um, I made you watch that um, as your supervisor. Um, which I'm sure will come back to cost me at some point. Um, what did you think of that uh, video and, and documentary and the good and the bad? So I, I think there's a lot of interesting things in Kiss the Ground and I, I, I like the idea of regenerative agriculture because the idea is that you should be working with 
other parts of the natural environment to regenerate your soil in particular, to make it more productive, which is a good thing. However, on the downside of Kiss the Ground in particular, um, it's a little bit unappealing to a conventional farmer. If, if, if you're trying to use that as a persuasive tool to get a conventional farmer to change over to regenerative agriculture, that's going to be a pretty hard sell because there's sort of a voice problem. And it has a lot to do with regenerative ag sounding like something that you would pick up at a hippie commune rather than what it should be, which is, you know, this is a business decision based on your ability to to aerate your ground with cattle and also uh, incorporate their manure as part of your ecosystem and your soil. Uh, No-till and low-till are parts of regenerative ag that have been a staple in the Palouse and the Dryerland regions of our state for many, many years. And um, you have to start selling it as a, a business benefit, I think, rather than this is going to make your heart feel good because it, it just doesn't, it doesn't have the same appeal. Yeah, it doesn't have the same appeal, especially when on many other fronts, farmers feel like um, they're being, you know, chipped away at. Um, right. And just come in and say, you should do this because it's it's good for the world. Um, it's like, okay, you know, look what look at all the other things you've done to me to make my life hard. Now don't ask me to to make you feel better. Um, I think it's a it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Well, I think it sort of goes back to the idea of legislating, legislating or um, operating based on feelings rather than facts. And regenerative ag has this great ability to be able to do both. They just choose not to, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, and there's a, and there's a cost, right? If you're not currently doing regenerative ag, you have to buy new equipment and things like that. So there's a real cost up front, right? Yes. Uh, if you if this isn't something that you are doing or is not um, functional for your farm, it gets very expensive very quickly. And it's also not the most effective thing. If you have a lot of annual crops that need tillage to be pulled out so you can put something new in, uh, you're you're talking about something that's just not effective. So I think there's the misnomer is that anybody can do regenerative ag. And I, that's just not quite true. Most people can, but not everyone can. Okay. Well, we're running out of time. Thank you everyone for your questions. There's a couple of questions, unfortunately, that I don't think I will be able to get to. Uh, but since we only have a few minutes left, um, talk a little bit about uh, what you are uh, working on next and what people can expect from you. Um, and then um, I think we talked about the session a little bit, but you know, sort of what's your what are your top issues for the next couple of months? Um, H2A and ag labor, um, they're, they're both connected and different at the same time. So I'll be talking a lot about that, I'm sure of it. Also, the tax study that you mentioned, uh, I am, I'm pulling apart the subheadings for um, business and operation taxes and um, some of the real estate taxes and making them into separate studies so that uh, you don't have to read the whole big study. You can and you can explore the minute detail uh, if you're so inclined in these um, shorter studies. And, you know, everything else I think is, um, I'm sure you and I will talk about carbon a lot uh, in the coming months as well. Uh, but I also, I think there's some other um, things you mentioned forest health earlier and also um, the video about wolf management and I think both of those um, straddle our particular areas of interest nicely and I do think that they're both going to be topics of discussion whether they're headline topics of discussion or um, more subtle I think those are both uh, on the menu soon yeah yeah, absolutely. So carbon taxes, there's a lot of talk about carbon taxes. There are, I think, at least two different carbon tax proposals. There's a cap and trade proposal, which is essentially a version of a carbon tax, similar to what California is doing. There is another version called the low carbon fuel standard, which is a regulatory uh, approach to reducing the uh, CO2 emissions from fuels, which is super expensive. Um, 
it, it is, I, I mentioned that the carbon tax was uh, $25 a metric ton. The low carbon fuel standard is currently $200 a metric ton in California, although they phase it in. So is it, it doesn't all hit uh, your gas tax or your price at the pump at once. So we're going to be working a lot on that. Um, we uh, will be doing some other videos with different tribes. Uh, we're doing a, we're working with um, another tribe in the North Puget Sound to talk about aquaculture um, and, and fish farming there and what they're doing, which is, is really interesting. Um, and then the session, uh, lots of things that will go on in the legislative session. So thank you, everybody. If you are not a, already a member, here's the information about how to become a member. We really rely upon you. The vast majority of our contributions are from small people who just want to be a force for um, uh, the free market and, and free market choices, um, as, as we talked about, sometimes the best lobbyists are just individuals who reach out to their legislator and just say, I'm concerned about this issue. Uh, often the best way that we get information are from individuals in the community who say, have you looked at this? We, we heard this. So we really appreciate your feedback, your support. Um, stay in touch with us at, the, uh, at our blog at WashingtonPolicy.org. And with that, I will Wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Um, and just remember when you're thankful, remembering what you're thankful for, remember the farmers. Thanks for the shout out, Todd.